<laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Tamura. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I am Pastor Lori's daughter. Um, a little bit about myself. I am fourth generation Japanese American, mother of a two-year-old daughter now named Elena, and I am now 30 <coughs> years old. Um, <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about turning red as you saw in the trailer. And I kind of think I was chosen to speak on this topic so I can like interpret it for the non 30 year old API people here. Cause you could definitely tell this was written by a 30 something year old. Um, and that person is this lovely lady, Domi Shi. And uh, she said that she based a lot of this movie on her own life as a 13 year old teenager growing up in Toronto. Um, as the only daughter of immigrant parents and a Chinese-Canadian girl. And so I think that's what makes this movie so special is that it was not only about and centered around a Chinese-Canadian girl, but it was actually created and the story was told by Chinese-American or Asian-American and Asian-Canadian women. Um, and Domi and the other women who worked on this film actually got to tell their own story instead of having someone else tell it for them or like being a consultant or contributor. And so I really feel like we could see that come through in this film, that we could really see their own experiences and lives influenced the story. And so, um, like I said, Domi kind of based it on herself. And so the movie is set in Toronto in 2002 and centers around a 13-year-old Chinese-Canadian girl named Maylin Lee. So we can see her introduce herself in this next clip. Hi, Maylin Lee. I turned 13, I've been doing my own thing, making my own moves, 24 7, 365. I wear what I want, say what I want, and I will not hesitate to do a spontaneous car wheel if I feel so moved. <laughs> <laughs> that thing that she pointed to, that's a Tamagotchi. When I watched it with Paul Hirose and Kendall, I realized one was too old and one was too young to know what that was. So that's what I mean, interpreting. That's a digital pet. You have to keep it alive. No, but um, May lives and works at a temple with her parents. Um, her mother's name is Ming and her father's name is Jin. And they own and run this temple. And so at this point, when we first meet her, life seems to be going pretty smoothly. Her Tamagotchi still alive. Um, and yes, yeah, she has to spend most of her time, you know, cooking with her parents, working for her parents. Um, cleaning with them, she says, you know, it's okay because it's not all about me. You know, I I do make my own moves, but just some of my moves are also my mother's. So we kind of see that she's starting to feel a little bit of tension between honoring her parents and honoring herself. But it seems manageable and in normal teenage fashion, she's like, I got it. This is, I got this all figured out. But that all changes when, as Domi, the director puts it, magical puberty hits. And in this film, that's represented by her becoming a large red panda. And May transforms into this red panda whenever she feels really strong emotions. Um, and so no, I don't think that this movie is actually about periods like other people might have said. So for those of you who blacked out after Ming brought out the pad, stay with me, because there's a lot more that happened after that part of the movie. Um, so going back to the panda, May freaks out when she first becomes a panda because like a lot of Asian parents, Ming conveniently forgot to warn her about to what was going to happen. You know, she thought she had more time. But alas, the time has come for Ming to explain to May what's going on. Um, and she learns that all of the women on her mother's side of the family actually went through the same transformation. Um, their ancestor, Sunny, was the first one to... Uh, transform into a red panda in order to protect her family. Um, and this ability has been passed on throughout the generations. But as her mother Ming puts it, what was meant as a blessing soon becomes an inconvenience. So we learn that May's grandmother and her aunties and her mother, they all have decided to seal their panda into a relic so that it doesn't come out anymore. And then they set a date for May to also seal her panda as well and encourage her to hide it as much as possible until they could perform the ritual where they could seal the panda. So this is a lot of information for May to take in all at once. And when she first hears about this, she's so angry with Sunny and she calls it a curse and she's overwhelmed and just wants it to stop and go away. 
Um, but eventually throughout the weeks go by as she has to wait for the ritual, you know, she learns to love it more. You know, she more of her friends find out and her schoolmates find out. And she realizes that her friends actually love her and accept her, panda or no panda. Um, yeah, you can see her friends are happy when she's a panda. And so with that, May begins to learn how to control the panda and actually even love and embrace it. However, as she's learning and going through this process, she hides it from her mother and, and father that she's been going in and out of this panda transformation because she doesn't want her family to know that she's disobeying them. So we're starting to see like a little tension and a little rift grow between May and her mother. And so by the night of the ritual, she's really grown to love her panda. She has so much fun. Her friends are enjoying it. And so when the time for the ritual arrives, she feels really torn between obeying her mother or choosing her own path and keeping her panda. And she's asking herself, do I continue to honor my parents by doing what they say? Or do I embrace this part of myself and choose to honor my own desires? Because her whole life, May has been taught to honor your parents by doing every single thing that they ask of you. You know, it's the least they could do because they gave you life and birthed you and raised you. And I'm sure many of us have been taught that too, you know, that honoring your mother and father means we have to do what they say. And, you know, we even have a Bible verse, a commandment to back it up. You know, and so I'm sure many Christians and parents have used this to get their children to do what they want or to treat them with some respect around here. And now I get to use it on Elena and be like, you have to honor me because that's what God says. But I wanted to find out and explore today, does honoring really mean just doing everything I say <laughs> or giving parents exactly what they want? and um, actually talk about, like, what does God actually have to say about this? Is that what he really meant? And so we're going to look at um, Ephesians today, because Paul talks about this commandment again um, in a letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6. And he writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And then he continues, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So N.T. Wright, a theologian, talks about this passage in his commentary on Ephesians and says that at the time that Paul wrote this, um, and even before, many people would say exactly what we're talking about, like children have no rights and they should just be obedient to their parents um, which is, like I said, how we kind of view it now. And you have to do what I say, whether you like it or not. You don't even have to like me, but you better respect me, that kind of message. And I even, when I was researching this, saw one famous writer said, like, children owe their parents only one thing, and no, it's not love. And he was talking about honor, and I was just baffled by that. But as I learn more about the triune God, I feel like this is, does not sound like the God that I know. You know, I feel like we learn all the time that God is about love and connection and would never say, like, don't love me, just honor me. As long as you honor me, it's okay. And, you know, basically everything that we've been learning about in the Contact Sermon series, it's all about connection and love. And so this interpretation of, like, children just need to be obedient and just need to honor me doesn't align with the God that I know or I feel like the one that we really learn about here. Um, and N.T. Wright kind of backs that up, and he agrees and says, actually, Paul would insist on a mutual responsibility that parents must also behave appropriately towards children, which means not being too harsh or provoking children so that they may become bitter, want to rebel, or run away. So he's saying, like, God is not telling parents, just order your children around, say, my way or the highway. But Paul is actually saying there's a mutual responsibility here and that parents should not be too harsh, as he says. Because um, we need more love and connection going both ways in the relationship. And he warns us that if not, um, it will cause children to become bitter and want to rebel and run away. And we see all three of these things happen in the movie, right? So May, on the night of the ritual, starts to, f and even before, starts to feel kind of bitter towards her mom because... She feels like her whole life she's been trying to be an obedient daughter. She's done everything right, but her mom still doesn't trust her. 
So of course she's like, what's the point of listening to her? So she decides to rebel and do her own thing. And in the end decides not to do what her mother says and keeps her panda and literally runs away to a concert. And so we see the rift that's been growing the entire movie comes to a head just as Paul predicts in this passage. And that could have been the end of it, right? That could have been the path going forward where May just continues to rebel and does her own thing and following her own path. And Ming, her mother, could have just kept trying to force her to stop and listen and do what they say and just keep getting angry with each other and stood their ground and grown farther and farther apart, which is how the cycle goes for many people. Um, but thankfully, May and Ming's story doesn't end there. After their literally huge fight at the Sky Dome, they end up back in, I don't know what to call it, so I just call it the magical bamboo forest. So we'll see what their interaction here. I, I hurt her. Who? My mom. I got so angry and I, and I lost control. I'm just so sick of being perfect. I'm never going to be good enough for her. I know what feels that way like all the time, but it isn't true. So we see in this scene that May is able to now see all of the pain and trauma that her mom is carrying with her. And she starts to piece together like, oh, my mom isn't treating me this way because she's a bad person or a bad parent. It's just that that's how she was raised, and she doesn't know any different. And so actually, her mother really does love her, and this is how she's showing it. Because that's how Ming's mother, Grandma Wu, raised Ming. <laughs> so there's Grandma Wu, Ming, and Mei. Um, and so we see in the movie, like, Ming's mother was really tough on her, even as an adult. And in this scene, in the forest, we could really see how much it has really affected her and all of the pain that she still carries because of it. And in reality, I think probably all of us have a little part that are still that inner child or inner teenager that longs for the things that we longed for as a child and has the same fears that we've had our whole lives, just like Ming talked about. And I bet if we saw teenager Grandma Wu in the forest, we would see her pain and trauma as well and maybe a desire for her to be loved by her parents um, and then we would begin to understand, like, she did truly want what was best for Ming, but just didn't know how to show it other than being strict and keeping a tight leash on her. And, you know, maybe if Ming just did everything that I asked of her and did exactly the way I said to do it, then she could keep Ming safe and make her successful. And that's exactly how Ming learns to care for her daughter and raises Mei in the same way, albeit with maybe a little more, like, care and affection. Um, but we see that pattern from Grandma Wu to Ming and then to Mei. But growing up, Mei doesn't know all of this backstory, so she just thinks that Ming doesn't trust her and is being unreasonable and all the things that teenagers think about their parents. But after seeing Ming in the forest now, she's able to see that this is actually like a generational trauma that has been passed down in her family. And she begins to understand Ming's perspective and mourn with her and begins to empathize with her. Because the truth is, like I said, we all have fears. And some of those fears have been inherited from our parents and our grandparents and are really, really hard to let go of. So I wanted to share about me and my family. And my parents are not like Ming and Jin, exactly. But family was definitely a top value growing up. You know, we ate dinner together, together every night and we had game nights every Friday. And although my mom cussed at every weekly game night. The only time I remember my dad cussing was when I didn't want to go on a family trip and he said it is blank important. You could fill in the blank. Guess what cuss word he said. Um, <laughs> but following what our parents said was mandatory. That was really drilled into me. Um, I didn't know that there was another way to live until my younger brother came along and I was like, wait, we don't have to do everything our parents say. I didn't know this rule. So, yes, most of my life I was the good girl, May, that we see at the beginning of the movie. You know, I spent a lot of time at church, not the temple, with my mom, and we had a good relationship, and she wasn't hard on me or intentionally put pressure on me, but 
because I was like close to her and wanted to be like her, I really didn't want to disappoint my mom. So it may come as a surprise to no one that I did not have a big rebellious phase. But as I grew older, you know, entered my 30s, became a mom myself, I started to enter this phase where I could see people that I looked up to or even idolized as like human, right? I saw their strengths and their flaws now. And so in that vein, I started to recognize and acknowledge that uh, some of the ways that I was hurt by my family. And I realized that one thing I was really hurt by by my mom was that she didn't stand up to my dad more for herself or for us. And, you know, it made me really sad and really angry when I thought about it and that she didn't do that for me and my brother growing up. And I think in doing so, I inherited that trait too, like being scared to use my voice and take up space. And so I felt a little bit upset, (laughs) angry with my mom for passing that terrible thing on to me. But um, like May, I was able to um, hear more of my mom's childhood stories or get a glimpse into her earlier life, although, you know, through her sermons, we didn't meet in a magical forest. And I learned, you know, more about the pain and trauma that she experienced, and she shared about being the daughter of an alcoholic. Um, And I was able to see the pain that she felt like watching her mom just silently bear it all. And I heard stories of my mom trying to stand up to her father, but getting shut down or maybe getting hurt even more. And how through that, she kind of learned, okay, I just need to stay silent and just do appease my father so that I feel safe. And that's, all that is something that I didn't really know as a child growing up because, like, yeah, I saw that he always had beer and he his house always smelled like cigarettes. But I didn't know, like, the abusive alcoholic man that my mom was growing up with. And instead, I actually grew up thinking that my mom was close to my grandpa because we lived so close to him and we saw him probably multiple times a week. I don't know, it was too little. But I remember seeing him a lot and that even though he wasn't like a jolly, overly affectionate grandpa, he was really caring with me and like always dropped by little random gifts. And, you know, I thought they were really close because I do remember when he passed and I remember my mom was like, that was probably the saddest I've ever seen my mom. And um, so I think naively I thought that that meant that they had a really good relationship. And it wasn't until after hearing more of my mom's stories that I got a glimpse of what she actually had to go through and how complicated the relationship was with her father and her mother. And through that, I began to understand more and more why it was so scary and hard for her to speak up to my dad. And so instead of feeling like just sad or mad about the things that she used to do or not didn't do, I began to feel more empathy and realize now that that was just because of the trauma that she experienced and was passed down to her. And I could see, in fact, that she actually did speak up more than her mom was able to. And now in my own marriage, I could speak up even more to Daniel. (sighs) I'm just kidding. I know we all can speak up to Daniel. Um, (laughs) But like I said, um, I didn't go through like a really big fight with my mom. We didn't have a throwdown. But Last year, we did have a really, really tough conversation, and I told her more ways that I felt hurt by her. Um, Yeah, and like how I said we spent a lot of time in the church together, and I told her like, yeah, I think all those hours that I spent like helping you, I was actually trying to like earn your love in some ways. I'm going to get emotional, sorry. Um, And... um, I didn't cry when I practiced last time, so I thought I was over it. But um, yeah, I was just hurt by the ways that she gave others attention over me. And I felt really alone sometimes because that desire that I had was to feel chosen and to feel special. And so I feel really lucky because like my mom has gone through a lot of therapy and a lot of healing. So one, I was like able to actually tell her, feel safe enough to tell her these things. And then, too, she received it so, so well. And I'm going to give myself a break (laughs) because we're going to watch the next clip. But I did get to hear some of the things that other children don't really get to hear, but that um, Ming got to say to May in this next clip that we could watch while I stopped crying. (laughs) No, Ming, 
Please, just come with me. I'm changing, Mom. I'm finally figuring out who I am, but I'm scared it'll take me away from you. Me too. I see you, Meme. You try to make everyone happy, but you're so hard on yourself. And if I taught you that, I'm sorry. So don't hold back for anyone. The farther you go, the prouder I'll be. Yeah. Um, so I love how in this scene they dug deeper between just their choice of like panda or no panda, but they actually shared their why and their fears and came to realize that they both really did love each other so, so much. Because, you know, we all do end up making our own decisions and living our own life. But at the end of the day, just like Mei and Ming, we just want to feel loved and valued and connected to one another. And I think that that piece is really important for us to recognize that we do all crave love and we do all have fears and that we're all in progress. And I feel like for me, that's been part of growing up is learning to see that we're all just figuring it out. Um, you know, my parents would probably say that they didn't really know what they were doing when they were raising me. And I know that Daniel and I really don't know what we're doing raising Elena, you know, trying to navigate adulthood and raising a child during a pandemic and all that while we still have our own inner children that need love and healing. And so once we start to recognize that, uh, I think that's when we can really start to have empathy and grace for one another and move towards more understanding and connection. Um, so now I feel like I see my mom, you know, I'm watching her live her life and there are things that I do want to do differently. But at the same time, I also understand why she did what she did. Um, and going forward, you know, I want Elena to be able to use her voice even more than me and um, hopefully experience some more generational healing versus generational trauma. And that's why I'm so happy that Elena, you know, gets to grow up with films like this because then she, hopefully she'll learn that it's okay to take up space and be herself because as a two-year-old, she is very loud like seriously got some pipes on her <laughs> and a lot of times when she's that loud and my instinct is just be like shh because shh, that's what like I inherited from my parents like don't make waves like be, don't be careful be quiet um and I actually have to like stop myself from making like a weird face or like making a side comment like oh my gosh isn't she so loud because I don't want her to feel shame about that and and I actually do want her to take up space and embrace that part of her and so I'm trying to like em encourage that within Elena too but also remember that she has to live her own life and choose her own path as well just like I did and my mom did etc and in the movie I love how May chooses not to just outright like reject her Canadian values or her Chinese values it wasn't about choosing like only honoring your parents or only honoring yourself, but that she found a third way to become her own person and still honor and love her parents. Because the truth is that there is no like clear way. There's no right or wrong way. It's not all good or bad. You know, it, it is a spectrum. And I personally think that things weren't meant to be like black and white. And as much as we try to put the triangle God in a box and say, here are the rules that they gave us to live by. This is right. This is wrong. This is what we do. This is what we don't do. I honestly feel like God is so much bigger and more creative and more fluid than that. Um, and that's why, to me, the commandment, honor your mother and father, is not just like, do exactly what I say. You know, it is about connection and empathy and love. Because honoring is not separate from loving. It's a fruit of love, right? It's out of love for our parents that we respect them and listen to them and take care of them. And I think the other part of honoring our parents is recognizing and appreciating all of the things that they went through and moving forward in the best way that we can, right? Just like May saw and recognized all the things that her mom went through and decided to like, no, this is best for me. 
and I still love and honor you with this. I'm just going to do the best that I can the way you did the best that you can, right? Because one generation or one idea is not all bad. You know, my great grandparents, my grandparents, my parents, they all did the best that they could with what they were given to navigate their world. And now we have to do our best to navigate ours. And in order to do that, we need to embrace ourselves just like May did and find our own voice, not just do it the way our parents did it. And we won't do it perfectly. You know, I know there will be things that I'll do that will become outdated and Elena will be scarred by it. But hopefully one day she'll understand that I was just doing the best that I could too. And so to close, I wanted to read an excerpt from a poem um, by Lacey Nguyen. She's a first generation Vietnamese American and she dedicates the poem in honor of my ancestors, those I do know, don't know, and carry with me in my body. And so she writes, and though there are days where I feel like I'm drowning in the trauma and cannot rise to see above my own pain, my body a broken record of generational curses that will never end. I remember that I'm from a long lineage of women who never knew how to take no for an answer, who fought wars, swam across oceans, and resisted empires and allowed their joy to transcend the imperial forces that wanted them to die, whose laughter was medicine to the sick in their communities and whose love binded together their families, who turned nail beds into easels and fingers into art galleries, who sowed seeds in foreign lands for generations to come. I am from a lineage of women who carry the strength of a million sons. They survived so that I could live so I will live.